For over 130 years, steam locomotives plied the Hunter Valley coal fields of New South Wales. Their era rolled to an end with the demise of steam on the private South Maitland Railway in 1983 and the closure of the sister Richmond Vale line four years later. By then, the two railways, very much survivors of a lost age, had found a place in the history books. They were Australia's last commercial steam rail operations, somehow enduring the winds of progress, unaltered over decades. For South Maitland and Richmond Vale, little change within a world of change. However, that same world, with its rising costs and competitive coal markets, signalled the end of the line for steam. But the last chapter in this remarkable story had not been written. For the 10-class locomotives of the South Maitland coal fields would have faced a destiny beyond coal haulage. Emerging from the twilight of Hunter Steam, they would embark on new journeys, some driven again by rekindled hearts of fire. The sights and sounds of steam across the Hexham wetlands had changed little in 130 years, somehow escaping the change progress brings. But for Richmond Vale, Australia's last commercial steam railway, the spring of 1987 would bring the end of the line. The Richmond Vale railway was being closed on economic grounds. The line's owner, Cole and Allied, stated its Stockington No. 2 colliery would need to reduce costs to remain viable. This included a decision to replace rail haulage by road. But the end of the line did not come quietly. Large-scale truck haulage commenced from Stockington Colliery using the rail loading facilities. For eight employees, the emotion of the railway's closure boiled over. Locomotive number 25 was taken to the Stockington Colliery, where the men blocked the mine entrance with private cars. One day before the official end of the line, road haulage of coal was stopped. Refusing to end the blockade and return the loco, the men were immediately sacked and retrenchment benefits withdrawn. <laughs> Police requests to clear the mine entrance are agreed to, but the men stay with number 25. The next day, the engine is moved to a more public location near Lenigan's Drive. With the support of family, friends and nearby residents, a sit-in protest commences. It would last for three weeks. During the protest, Cole and Allied states it would enter into discussions with the men only after the locomotive was returned. On October the 15th, after a meeting between the men, 25 steams across the Hexham wetlands for the last time. The protest is over. At following meetings with the company, the men would have their entitlements restored, but the railway remained closed. Truck haulage did not help Stockington's viability. The colliery outlasted the railway by just nine months, closing in June 1988. In the months following the railway's closure, there was talk of a tourist use for the line. However, a feasibility study undertaken at the time by Cole and Allied and the Newcastle City Council showed the proposition to be uneconomic. The railway's Hexham sidings remained undisturbed, in contrast to once hectic activity. 
As nature reclaimed the site, new inhabitants moved among stationary coal wagons. The wagons were once a familiar sight in the Newcastle area, with large painted letters denoting the colliery of origin. Their unique design allowed the timber hopper to be lifted from the mainframe and emptied into waiting coal ships. With the introduction of modern loading, Richmond Vale became the last outpost for this distinctive rolling stock. Several hundred remained in use, but most were scrapped following the line's closure. Some 60 were saved, silent reminders of days now past. Storage of the four steam locomotives continued at Hexham. Expressions of interest from overseas buyers had been received, but owners Cole and Ally decided to donate the engines in trust to a local museum group. 7 a.m., Saturday, July 8th, 1989. As winter winds chill the Hexham sidings, the culmination of months of planning takes place. The group to benefit from the company's generous donation was the Richmond Vale Railway Museum, based at the disused Richmond Main Colliery. With considerable assistance from local firms, the voluntary museum crew worked to carefully lift each locomotive onto a low loader fitted with a section of track. As no rail link remains to the Richmond main site, road transport is required to transport the 60-ton machines. The first engine to leave the rails was number 30. Originally used on the former South Maitland line, 14 of these locos were built in England between 1911 and 1924. Flying the South Maitland Railway initials on their side tanks, these locos provided faithful service on that line for over six decades. From the early 1970s, they also worked the Richmond Vale line. With chains firmly attached, number 22 then left the track. It was a well-executed operation, which saw the locos eased onto the transporters with little difficulty. Next in line, number 25, the engine used in the protest following the railway's closure. Although its boiler had long gone cold, 25 did not leave the loco shed quietly, as air hissed sharply from cylinder drain valves. With the last locomotive suspended over the rails, so ended Steam's 130-year residence on the Hexham wetlands. The loco shed stood empty after the decades of activity which went with steam. With the final loading complete, all was in readiness for the 20-kilometre journey to Richmond, Maine. It was 11 a.m. Soon the locos would leave. In few places in the world had such an example of living industrial history remained intact. Yet, while Richmond Vale could not survive as a commercial operation, its motive power continued to fascinate. What was it about steam that had brought so many out this winter morning? For in the cold light of day, the locos might seem simply machines no longer required in the modern world. But as the convoy left, it was obvious that the region had not seen the last of these engines. For the 10 class of Richmond Vale, a new journey had begun.
tranquil setting of the former Richmond Main Colliery belies its hectic past. 1,200 employees once worked the mine which closed in 1967. The complex near Curry is now home to the Richmond Vale Railway Museum, created by a group of volunteers. Joining the museum's rail exhibits, the four Hexham locomotives, following their 40-minute road journey. It was ironic that road haulage, earlier responsible for the engine's demise, was now essential for their survival, with the mine's original rail link long since removed. But one could almost sense the locos sigh with relief as they rejoined their roads of steel. Assisting with the operation was Marjorie, a former Newcastle industrial locomotive. Built in 1938, the restored engine shunted its older charges into position. Few railway museums have received steam locomotives in such complete condition. With four identical engines, the task of preservation would be eased considerably. By 2 p.m., the four locomotives stood at Richmond, Maine. However, for museum volunteers, the end of one job brings the start of another. Having passed a boiler examination, locomotive number 24 was given the all clear for steaming. Just two weeks after its arrival, the engine warmed for the first time in almost two years. A gentle heat was first applied to allow even warming of the boiler. Supervising the firing process was Milton Alderson, a former driver of Marjorie in its days as a Lysart's engine. He explains the initial use of a wood fire. After the logo has stood for so long, it's very wise to bring a fire up slow because inside there you have two metals. You have a copper firebox with a steel boiler. And the comparison, the expansion rate between the two is vastly different. By bringing a quick fire into it, it could crack the stays in between the, the firebox and the boiler. And by doing this is dangerous and is also creating a lot more unnecessary work. As the morning drew on, coal was added to raise the fire temperature. Work continued throughout the morning. Carol? Yeah? Where are you? Oh, can you close it up again, Mike, please? The cool, overcast conditions at Richmond, Maine made for images from a past era. Quietly going about their duties, Volunteers tended this machine of fire, water and iron. Few problems were experienced as the loco gained pressure. The benefits of dry storage at Hexham were realised. Within four hours, 24 safety valves opened as full boiler pressure was reached. The skywards rush of escaping steam signalled not only the working condition of the loco, but that a sleeping giant had been awakened.
the former mine complex was an appropriate background to 24's return to steam. Once the showpiece of the South Maitland coalfields, Richmond, Maine provides an impressive symbol of a bygone era. Now the subject of a permanent conservation order, the site presents a window on the past, a time when imposing cathedral-like structures housed essential pit-top machinery. Those once vital mine components now lie scattered, disused, and all but forgotten. But the legacy of early mines lies beyond the crumbling brickwork of abandoned collieries. There was a time when mine buildings and poppet heads were a common sight, an age when steam winding engines sounded both good and hard times for those who won the coal. Many collieries represented more than employment. They were the very heartbeat of nearby communities, as shown in this 1950s Miners' Federation film, Cures of Coal. On the coal fields, the mining towns were growing. In one industry towns, our lives revolve around the pit. And if we hewed out our dag of 20 tons of coal a day, we got a living. Enough to pay the rent and keep the family going. We built our churches and homes, our schools and pubs and stores. Coal was bread and butter to us, and a black pint or two to wash the coal dust from our throats. Against the wattle-lined route of an ageless background, number 24 was soon hauling passenger carriages during open days at Richmond, Maine. The first of the fleet back in steam, the locomotive eased its train along a rebuilt track. The four 10-class engines were additions to an impressive railway collection at the site. The display includes two early Richmond Vale locomotives, numbers 9 and 10. Named Pellow, Maine and Richmond, Maine, the English-built locos entered service around 1910. They remained working into the late 1970s, where the engines could be found at Hexham. While much of the collection is on static display, museum members hope to restore many items to working order. Ongoing activities at Richmond, Maine include track laying. Assisted by financial grants and donated materials, volunteers have completed extensive track work at the site. However, the major project involved the rebuilding of the five kilometre line to the Pellor, Maine colliery site. Using materials funded by the Steel Regions Assistance Program, work commenced on the railway during 1988. For the volunteer crew, journeys aboard work trains became a regular event. All labour, materials and equipment were transported by rail. As each new section was completed, the train would proceed over the relayed track, rails travelling upon rails. A long way from its industrial days, Marjorie felt the load as it positioned the work train. With the end of the line reached, unloading of rail commenced. Bundles of sleepers then appeared through nearby bush. While most rail laid was second hand, many sleepers used in the track relay were new. Felled near Richmond, Maine, Timber was delivered to this Morissette sawmill and cut into sleepers.
With sleepers and rail positioned and track gauge established, drilling commenced. Positioned by hand, spikes were then driven in by air hammer. With four spikes per sleeper, the task was enormous. The track project also included the construction of this new bridge for the Pelo main line. While the railway embankment remained intact, some original structures had deteriorated. The use of fire during the project was not limited to Marjorie. The 10 class locomotive boilers are the result of complex manufacture. Internal components include these crown stays. Positioned at the rear of the boiler, the stays strengthen the firebox. Large stresses occur in steam loco boilers and it's essential that crown stays remain in good order. We've got a few problems with 25. Can uh, the boiler inspectors found some crown stays to be uh, necked away so we'll have to replace those and this is one we've got out. You can see how far it's... Yeah, it's worn a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Corroded away so we'll have to get filled to make some new ones. With spares no longer available, the restored blacksmith's shop at Richmond, Maine came to the fore. Drawing on eight years' experience, volunteer blacksmith Phil Johnson commenced forging new crown stays for number 25. At first, a round steel billet is heated in one of the colliery's original coke forges. Reaching the correct temperature, the billet is then placed under an electric power hammer. A two-man crew operate the hammer as the blacksmith forges a neck into the billet. The process requires constant reheating of the steel. Over time, the billet is gradually lengthened and tapered. The power hammer, donated by a local mine supply company, was built in Manchester, England during the 1940s. Fifty years on, it's being used to maintain Manchester-built steam locos. As forging continues, a hexagonal head is added. The almost complete crown stay is hand straightened using an anvil. Later, tapered threads would be added to the stay ends. In addition to engine restoration, acquisition of rolling stock continued. These three passenger carriages were seen leaving Maitland bound for Richmond, Maine in late 1989. It seems appropriate that the once grand mine is fulfilling this new role beyond coal production. For at Richmond, Maine, rails from the past are reaching towards the future.
The Hunter's 10 class locomotives were built for the East Greeter Coal Company, which later evolved into South Maitland Railways. Constructed by Bayer Peacock, the first engine entered service in 1912. Further locomotives were ordered, with a total of 14 in service by 1926. Somehow surviving the varying fortunes of the coal industry, the engines remained in use until 1983. However, by June of that year, rising costs brought the end of steam on the South Maitland Railways. In contrast to later events on the Richmond Vale line, the end came quietly. Years later, the complex stood as a bleak reminder of the days of steam. The site was purchased in 1989 by the Hunter Valley Training Company, an apprentice training initiative. The former railway workshops were soon the center of new activity as young people used the site for trade skill training. Meanwhile, the steam locomotives remained in storage. Only one had left the fleet, transported to Newcastle, Number 19 was lifted onto display at Port Waratah Coal Services in September 1983. Seven years on, and new events were to involve seven of the locomotives stored at the training company site. January 1990, and oiling of the engines is underway. On hand to assist, former Richmond Vale railwayman Ray Cross. Careful attention was required as the engines would soon leave the shed. Also present was former South Maitland Railways driver Bill Perry, who retired in 1981. The preparation of the engines allowed his past to be revisited. For Bill, an interest in steam went beyond his 34 years with the railway. Steam seems to get into your blood, I think, and once it's there, once you've been working on them, well, that's, it's there to stay. <laughs> I found that out from a lot of others too, you know. They, you hear that same story everywhere from anyone that's been working on steam. Right, very scientific. With weatherproofing in place, all was in readiness. This chimney doesn't pay, but we better at the top. Yeah, they're just along this one. January 30th, 1990. The move of the locos is underway at the Maitland complex. Sister engines to the four now at Richmond, Maine, roll again, hauled by a state rail diesel. The seven locomotives had been purchased by local railway enthusiast Chris Richards, eager to preserve the engines as a single group. Well, I purchased the locomotives because I believe they're one of the most important, if not the most important, um, industrial steam locomotive collection in the world. They're entirely intact, and I think it's important to keep them intact. And uh, I bought them basically to keep them together as a collection. They exist today, the whole 14 of them. They've never been cut up or scrapped, and um, it's very, very important to keep it. It's like a very fine art collection or an antique collection. Um, museums um, would prize these overseas, and we're extremely fortunate, um, probably the one of the most fortunate countries in the world, to have such a fine original collection of industrial steam locomotives. The seven locos were eased into temporary storage at the training company site. Owner Chris Richards plans to use the engines as the basis for a tourist railway on a disused Hunter Vineyards branch line. By early afternoon, the move was complete, with the line of engines quietly facing a future beyond coal haulage. Metres away, the South Maitland Railway remained in operation, with coal trains from Cessnock's Pelton Colliery pulled by state rail diesels.
the East Greeter Junction signal box, the mainstay of past steam operations, remains in use. The last two locomotives of the former South Maitland Railway's fleet were retained by the training company, as explained by its chairman, Milton Morris. We wanted to keep two locomotives, and we chose the first of the line, which is number 10, and we chose number 18 because of its particular boiler that our apprentices can work on. We wanted to keep two. We proposed to restore them to original condition. Mr. Morris is a former Liberal State Transport Minister. His duties included this function marking the end of steam on the New South Wales railways. The date was March 2nd, 1973, and the Minister was called upon to drive this steam loco through a banner at Broadmeadow Station. And one word of advice to those who are on the uh, up platform, which is this one, do stand back if I've got to drive the engine through the, uh, through the barrier. Seventeen years on, Mr Morris believes steam locomotives to be more than machines. They are special. They have a, an attraction about them. Uh, from my point of view, I notice that they are a great leveller of ages and position and so on. Everyone who has this common interest in steam locomotives has an identity and it brings people together. The restoration of the first training company locomotive commenced using the combined efforts of apprentices and volunteers. It was no ordinary task for the engine was number 10, the SMR fleet leader the first of the 14 built for the East Greeter Coal Company. Steam locomotives were not new to the training company. Its apprentices had restored engine 3801 for state rail. Those skills were in use again, with work on TENS boiler fittings underway. Heading the enthusiast team was Ray Cross. With decades of steam experience, including the locos at Richmond Vale, Ray coordinated the volunteer effort. Work included repainting and minor repairs. Former South Maitland and Richmond Vale employee John Sullivan assisted with adjustment of the loco's throttle. Passing its boiler examination, the loco was prepared for a steam test. The last locomotive in steam at the South Maitland complex had run during 1983 prior to the introduction of diesel coal haulage. Seven years on, that past site returned, as March 1990 saw the return to steam of number 10. The veteran loco stood quietly hissing, in marked contrast to the events which lay ahead. With a successful return to steam, number 10 was soon working its former South Maitland depot. Providing access for restoration of a brake van, the loco shunted the seven stored engines. Nearby residents may have taken a second look as past scenes reappeared at East Greeter Junction. Joining Ray Cross on the footplate was former SMR employee Mick Kirkman, who had provided valuable expertise to TEN's restoration.
While number 10 performed the work with ease, the task also allowed an important load test of the engine. Two weeks later, the locomotive was easing the restored brake van towards the training company workshops. On board, official guests arriving for the formal handover of the complex. That's nice. Want some more of those? Presenting the company with the title deeds was Sir Neil Curry, chairman of Colin Allied, former owners of the site. For number 10, now in its 80th year, this public appearance was impressive. However, an even greater debut awaited. During the last days of April, a past era returned to the streets of Maitland. With Steamfest 90 underway, so began the city's annual celebration of the Age of Steam. Arriving at Maitland Station for the festivities, former Newcastle Flyer engine 3801. Restored by the Hunter Valley Training Company, the loco was just one reminder of the days of steam. Also on display, this Foden steam truck. Returned to working order by Navy apprentices from HMAS Narimba, the 1923 machine rattled its way around Steamfest. Other road users included a 1912 Buffalo Pits traction engine. The American steam tractor worked the New South Wales Narrabri district before ending its days powering a sawmill. Traction power took on many forms, including this Aveling Porter steam roller. The Gentle Giant was once used on council roadworks in the Sydney area. Joining displays of vintage farm machinery was this Marshall portable engine built in Gainsborough, England. The 1914 machine once powered a shearing shed in northern New South Wales. But for some, the age of steam meant no more than a face full of smoke and ear-piercing whistles. With some 70 stalls trading, Maitland's Church Street became the centre of activity as the past mingled with the present. Steamfest activities were also underway at nearby East Greeter Junction. While interest in the steam era continues, it's not new. Even a century earlier, these fiery workhorses were regarded as more than machines. An 1880s book on locomotive driving begins. I love to see one of those huge creatures with sinews of brass and muscles of iron strut forth from his stable. There he stands, champering and foaming upon the iron track, his great heart a furnace of glowing coals his lymphatic blood boiling within his veins. Steamfest 90 represented number 10's first major public appearance following restoration. Open days at the training company workshops allowed visitors to experience the 10-class leader under steam. A chance also to capture the event for the family album. This centuries-old technology still captivates. Any doubt that it will continue is perhaps answered in the fascination shown by the young.
The locomotives spend both days of the festival steaming along the former SMR sidings. Joining the footplate crew was Bill Perry. Reliving sights and sounds of 34 years at South Maitland Railways. And so the days drew on. Crowds came and went, only to be replaced by those ever curious about steam. For Ray Cross, Ten's restoration provided a chance to be involved in the new days of Maitland Steam. In December 1972, Ray had crewed the last steam hauled coal train out of East Greeter Junction on the Government Railway. Now, very much at home on Number 10's footplate, he was driving steam towards a new future. I never thought I'd ever be back. Um, it's been a great thrill to uh, be involved with this project. As with so many others, steam locomotives are more than machines for Ray. Well, I think it's just, you've got a, a living steam, they're a beast, you know, and um, it's just hard to define than what it is with um, steam. It'll never, it'll never die out the interest while ever we've got um, engines like this old girl still going. Now heading the volunteer effort assisting the training company, Ray Cross was earlier involved in the 1987 fight over Richmond Vale's closure. Three years on, would he have reacted differently given the choice? Never. No, I'd have done the same thing. Uh, given the chance again, I'd have been there at the front with the rest of the boys. These days, perhaps part of that struggle has been won, with the 10 class back in steam. One may wonder what Bayer Peacock would have thought of all this attention. Of its 10 class pioneers still in steam 80 years on, and the 13 sister engines which followed intact and preserved. And of the sight of locomotives which outlived their manufacturer steaming into the 1990s and beyond. At the end of the day, there is perhaps one certainty. The Hunter Valley has not seen the last of the 10 class. As the locomotives set proudly forth on new journeys, powered by the warmth of rekindled hearts of fire. Thank you.